So on the show today, Nita Little. So Nita is one of the founding figures in the contact improvisation world, uh, works with activism, very thoughtful person in the dance world from what I can see. Um, I'm in contact myself and I kept asking around, I kept saying, you know, who's is a deep person, who's a psych, working with psychology, who's a thinker, who's interesting in this field that we could get for the conference. And I think that Nita's name was the name that came up most often. Um, so I said, you know what, ahead of the conference, I'd really like to interview her. So um, Nita, welcome. Thank you. Mark, it's nice Good to get to know you. <laughs> Pleasure. Where are you in the world today? I am in the Seattle area, out of the fires, thank God. West Coast Good. fire. West Coast is on fire right now. Glad you're okay. So how did you get interested in the body, Nita? How did it all start for you? Oh my God. That's, that's a question <laughs> that takes me back to probably being three or four years old when there was no distinction between body and mind and I was simply dancing. I was probably born dancing. And um, I have been dancing since then. And so okay. there was never a time when I wasn't interested in it. Is it dancing as a kid? Did you become a professional dancer? Did you do any particular dance studies? What happened yeah, next? And I have a fabulous dance background. Got to study with some amazing teachers, everyone from Jose Limon to, I studied at the Graham Studios with Takako Asakawa with, um, um, in ballet with um, um, Alfredo Corvino, Maggie Black. I have just, just um, classes with uh, really Merce Cunningham stars. I really have a really wonderful and blessed background in contemporary dance, modern dance. And then um, I went to college, to Bennington College, and got to um, work with Judith Dunn and people who were interested in improvisation. Um, Bill Dixon, black jazz musician, uh, and they were partners. So I had that orientation um, uh, into that, in, that kind of channel into dance improvisation. And from there met Steve Paxton, he was new faculty. And almost immediately Steve and I started working in a studio, um, exploring those materials that became contact improvisation. Okay, so this is the famous Steve Paxton. Uh, how was that in the early days meeting him? Oh, you know, he was a beautiful Adonis curly hair in his 30s, early 30s, and um, had just come from working with Cunningham Company and worked with um, a fabulous improvisation company. And um, he was, he was um, challenging and interesting. He also was an Aikido practitioner, did... Um, my background so I this when I first did contact right. I was like oh it's like Aikido without the throws right. you know so he taught he taught us some um, Aikido roles there were three of us in a studio quite frankly me and two men and Steve we were exploring um, materials of being in touch and so I learned Aikido roles <laughs> but then it immediately of course since our interest was not in manipulating each other, but rather in how is it we negotiate this moment, this right. incident. And that was a huge difference, even though the underlying principles like such things as weight falls to the underside, those principles remain constant for both forms. The, uh, the, the interiority of it is very, very different. The logic of it is very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly the purpose of it as well. Like, like, what are we doing here? Even if there's shared sort of functional, structural type things, it's a very different activity. Yeah, e extremely different. So my interest is in how do so, I... Yes, uh, how did it get born? What was the idea or the initial? Well, I had, as I said, I had been interested in improvisational scores. And so um, in Steve's very first class, it was a compositional class, 
He said, bring in something you've been working on. And I'd been working on this negotiation between two people coming together. I'd made a piece, two people coming together down on the floor and having to negotiate who would end up being on top of the other person standing. You know, so one person is standing, the other person is on their shoulders or, or higher. <laughs> and, um, and then that decomposes back down to the ground and they go out. And so I was, I was struggling with this, this construction, this improvisation, what we would call a score. And um, I wasn't really struggling with it, but I, was, I, I was, had questions about it. And um, he said, let me take you into a studio and show you how not to get bruised. So we went to a studio with the young man I was working with, who really wasn't a dancer yet, but was learning. And um, we started to work on that kind of set up an inquiry that then, of course, proceeded and went much further, much further than my tiny little score. Because mm -hmm. it, that context that we started to investigate, how is it people come together and stay together? Right. And in terms of, you know, it's difficult because I'm sure we'll get into it, it's this moving, evolving thing. But in terms of when people say, what's contact improv? For non dancers, you might not know technical terms. Um, you know, would that be the study of how people come together and move together, how people make contact? I mean, in some ways, it's an incredible, simple, simple idea, right? At the beginning, yeah, beginning sure contact way makes it not so simple. Shared way, right? Uh, but if you were to describe it, you could. I've seen people say, "Look, here's the basic idea, not the, the practice of it, of course, but the basic idea." People can convey quite quickly, in the sense that it's it's not um, a complicated notion like I don't know capoeira or something. Yeah, it is. Um, um, it, it, one could say that it is um, a dance sport. That, um, terms um a woman dina devita um uh, coined but i think steve used a lot uh to describe the structure in which people come together um in share sharing weight in physical contact remaining in physical contact um through a duration and they uh sorry my phone just rang and i thought i had right. it stop. <laughs> and yeah. um, and they um, and together they negotiate movement that that takes them th into having to manage together the the physics of of motion. So we work with momentum together. We you know, we work with um, weight and supports the, the the vast variety of structures that can. Uh, arise while you are in physical touch. So it looks something like um, it's not wrestling because you're not fighting, you're not trying to undo one another, but you're certainly in as deep a contact. You, it's not, um, it's n not manipulation. The, um, one of the early agreements was that we do not manipulate one another. We do, I do not make your choices for you. I can communicate to you possibilities, but I do not make your choices. So unlike, unlike partnering at the time that was, was going on, a man was not lifting a woman up into the air. We don't lift one another. In you fact- do things people as such, right? This is in some ways quite radical. You don't pick a person up, do a thing to a person, throw them on the floor. It's always do, a conversation, right? Exactly. We do not do things to each other. We offer the possibility that someone could um, be above and, and um, um, be on top of another person. Be some, one person could be supporting, the other person could be flying. It can look quite dramatic, like body surfing, or it could be very gentle and rolling on the floor. It's got, right. There's all these possibilities, right? Depending on the mood and the dancers and the, you know, everything between. Exactly. It's, very, it's, it's actually quite stunning at times. And, and, uh -huh. and the physics of it um, make it look terrifying to people because they aren't inside able to hear the interior conversation that's taking place, which is happening within milliseconds. 
this mutual oh. listening and I've always found it a wonderful practice for developing sensitivity for really tuning in to, to each other and that yes. mutual listening makes it much safer than it could be I was always surprised how few injuries there are in contact given you know this sort of what could be quite extreme situations right exactly I mean I don't think I've ever had a real injury and I've done some wild things <laughs> mm -hmm. okay so um the, the agreements of any art, I think, are almost the, the, the sort of the rules, you know, the, so the agreements there are what? Oh, I have had one injury. Okay, go on. I, I had one injury. Years. I'm just <laughs> remembering. This one injury, I was in, I was teaching in Italy. Um, uh, I met a guy who did contact tango or tango contact. Uh, uh, uh. And he, he immediately took me and flipped me. I mean, with force uh, up on, on around his, sh and my arm was not in a, in a position that could manage that. So he totally I... um, strained my arm. And, and that's why we don't manipulate. Right, right. Uh, there's no leader and follower in contact. It's not a tango dance in that sense. Okay, okay. So if there's no leader and follower, people might say, well, how does it work? What, what would you say to that? Um, uh, um, you are offering, the moment offers possibilities and potentials that you are together sharing as much as you know about that moment and those potentials and somebody's making a choice. I've seen contact because now contact's nearly 50 years old mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and of course me, <laughs> um, don't take that too far. <laughs> um, so the um so interior to those moments one is listening one is communicating possibilities and one is is um saying sometimes you're saying no sometimes mm -hmm. you're saying yes Declining you're making offers, making offers you have to feel the embodiment of um one another uh what what is and this is where I can, my work comes in. Um, you have to listen to what the other person is attending to. You have to be hearing their attention, which is physical, the physicality of their attention. And so it, even since the very, very early days, I've been interested in how the mind is embodied. And um, I eventually went and got a PhD because I had learned so much. And I wanted to know what did the world know about the embodiment of the mind, and I discovered they don't know that much. I mean, they know <laughs> they know a fair amount in terms of um, uh, neurology, but there's a whole vast swaths of of what how that works out as in in practice that I think is completely unknown or not recognized. So that was has been my work. My work is very much about the embodiment of attention or rather the articulation of presence. How is it we are present? And where do you fall on that sort of body-mind question then? You know, some people are more into the philosophy of this. Obviously, anyone listening to a, something called the Embodiment Podcast has probably got some sense of body-mind holism or mind-body integration. Where, where do you kind of fall on that? I, I, I live within this span of theory and practice. I turn practice, I, I take practice and speak of it in theory and can speak in terms of it theoretically or in practical terms. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's why I went back to get the PhD because I'm a practice-based person. And this is an interesting thing about contact as if we talk about the culture of contact, I think it's very interesting as well compared to, you know, make comparisons, but it has a journal It has contact quarterly and contact people often when they're speaking are, you know, there's almost quite intellectual and quite um, thoughtful and they'll talk about research, for example, you know, and they mean that term slightly differently than most people would understand it, I think. But there, there's a, a culture around sort of, you know, research and journals and things like this, which is not the case in, say, tango. Right. Well, yes. Um, and and um, I, we can't talk about the contact quarterly without invoking the name of my beloved friend, the late Nancy Stark Smith, 
who was the um, primary editor. She was editor with Lisa Nelson. And, um, and the Qu Contact Quarterly has just undergone a big shift to being an online only publication in Nancy's lifetime. It was always a hardbound, a, a, a solid <laughs> a piece that, that is actually a very beautiful um, journal if you ever catch one. Um, mm. So yeah, it, 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 uh, but I would, sure. I, when you talk about research, I just wrote a paper actually mm -hmm. with Colleen Bartley um, about the, um, the birth of contact and the, and the fact that contact is based in research from the very earliest days, those days when I was talking to you about, um, which I was telling you about um, when we were in a studio, three of us exploring what this could be. How is it that we do the, how is it we stay together? That was an act of inquiry, inquiry in every moment. That then took us all, Steve got a, um, a grant and we ended up doing a performance piece with a whole bunch of people um, doing contact uh, improvisation. Of course, they had all had to be taught contact improvisation at this point. It then had the name, uh, Steve took me into the office, <laughs> met him in the office one time, and he said, what do you think about calling this contact improvisation? And I said, yeah. What were the other, what were the other alternatives? Was there anything else on the table? Was it going to be no, called? Um, no, not no, that. It's always contact improv. Was it going to be called wake flow or something else? <laughs> Not that he told me about. I, you know, we went straight for that, I guess. Um, and um, so he brought all these people together, uh, young dancers. They were all college age, mostly. And there was Trisha Brown, Barbara Dilley came, people from the Grand Union uh, uh, joined us. But um, uh, um, the, uh, but we performed for five days five hours a day in a, ga in a gallery setting on mats, on Aikido mats, which was very different than what we had been doing in a studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, studio I've done different, makes it makes a difference. Very different when there's both, yeah. yeah. So, so there's this element of inquiry, and this I think is really maybe obvious to some contact dancers, but it's a bit unique, or at least unusual, that it's an ongoing piece of research around the world with different people that take it in different directions. It's growing. It's, it was very deliberately not um, copyrighted, you know, unlike a lot very of things. Very deliberately not decision. copyrighted. Yeah. It yeah. flows, yeah. it evolves. There isn't a qualification. Like you can't, you know, do a teacher training in contact improv as far as I know. I've never seen one advertised. Um, and it, it has this ongoing, evolving research quality to it as a sort of loose body of work and a loose community. And that, that's a bit different than most things that tend to be great. This is five rhythms. This is Aikido, Aikido. You know, people tend to put fences around things much more. Yeah. And when they put fences around things, things tend to, um, they stop, they stop um, at that point. Um, and then people do these efforts and to, to stretch it. But in contact, that it's this this very soft boundary, the soft edge, which you know. Right now, for instance, there's this discussion about um, touch and play. Is it contact? Is it not contact? Mm -hmm. um, and and um, I'm perfectly happy with touch and play being touch and play being um, emergent from contact improvisation, which I think it is. Is it contact improvisation to the, I would say no to the degree that it's they- It's got this sexual um, element to it, right? It's got this, it's got this sexual element to it. It's, it's, it's so much this, more rough it, than practice. It's got this real inquiry into sensuality that is sexuality, that, that has this dive into sexuality. And I- Yeah. And contact Sorry, improvisation is not not sensual. But the yeah. dive is not into the sexual. The dive is into communication. Right, what right, is right. It? What is it here that we can attend to that takes us into a deeper and more profound ability to move well together? Uh-huh, uh -huh. 
for a question. world of motion together. It, yeah. it does not have an end result in sexuality, for instance, or yes, maybe I shouldn't say that as an end result, but it does not, it does not go that direction. And the issue for me with touch and play is the second you take a contact moment and that sensuality and you start to edge it towards um, this kind of sexual uh, chemistry, you, the orientation, the ability to listen to certain levels of, for instance, um, the, the, the level of, of subtlety that um, embodied attention takes. If I'm inside your body with my attention, and that's a physical action, that's a tactile action, I'm really deeply listening inside you. What am I listening for? I'm listening for what, what it is you can know and how you can know it and what you're, the choices you're making, your relationship to the earth. All of these things are, are ways that I can come to speak to you without words. Um, and that's a growing area of inquiry. That for me is an expanding area of inquiry that gets completely um, uh, rerouted by sexual energy because mm -hmm. sexual energy will take all of it and curve it into a particular direction. Different focus. And what are you paying attention to now? What are you interested in when you dance with someone after all these years? Um, I'm, wow, so many levels, but um, I, I am interested in, in how contact does not necessarily require skin to skin touch. That uh, where does this contact begin? The contact can begin here, for instance. My one hand can feel the presence of the other hand. I'm interested in how is it that presence acts? How is it that presence acts? I'm That's interested a... in the articulation of presence, both within another body. So mm -hmm. where's the presence in, of one hand present inside another body? And um, um, my, my body present inside another body, someone else present within me, how do I know? Um, but also as a, spatial, uh, as a spatial phenomenon, what is it that's happening with presence here? And that takes a really finely tuned sense of embodiment. Mm -hmm. So embodiment, why is it important to you? What's the, the why in there for you? Um, everything we can know Everything we can feel requires a body. Mm -hmm. There are bodies that are concurrently, simultaneously mind. So I think of the body not as a body and mind, but as body mind. And I'm looking at that territory where language does not, cannot distinguish between is that body or is that mind that is acting? We tend to attribute certain things to mind and other things to body. But there's this territory where you can't tell mm -hmm. because it's both. So finally, I mean, think of body mind as this, this continuum. I think of it as a, um, as a Mobius strip. It looks like it's two sides, but in fact, it's one side. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you stop that Mobius strip at any point, you, you discover two sides, mind and body. But in motion, it's going to only be a one-sided structure. And that's what living is like. We're one-sided structures, mind bodies, not bodies with minds. And that territory where you can't tell, is this mind or body functioning, is very juicy. Do you mean some of the more sort of subtle things? Like when you're partnered with someone, is that, is that intention? Is that actually a subtle movement? Who knows, right? They're kind of, how do I know that they want to move in that direction? You know, am I well, feeling a subtle people, relationship? 
if you can feel the movement of the mind tactily, as a, as a tactile phenomenon, for me, um, I, I've uh, wrote a paper with um, a colleague, Joe Duman, on um, the tactility of attention. It's coming out in a, in a book uh, out, out of the UK, uh, probably this year. Um, but attention is tactile. So can I feel the tactility of, of your attention within my own form or within the spaces? I mean, think of, think of uh, being at a, a traffic light and turning around and not knowing why you're turning around, but seeing that somebody's looking at you. Yeah, there's a number of phenomena like that, some of which are fairly well documented. That's where you can't tell, is it mind or body? Mm. What mm. got set off? What did you know? It's, it's interesting how people develop sensitivity to this, you know, and I've heard snipers talk about it. I've also heard, um, you know, definitely martial artists who play with this quite a lot, Paul Linden being one, you know, intention where that becomes bodily. Is it mental? Is it bodily? Who knows? It's both. It's neither. Um, and certainly having a practice where one can explore that, I, I think the levels of subtlety one can become apparent to by tuning into someone else are, are uh, unusual and not necessarily commonsensical to most people. But when you get to them, they lead to really this profound trust. Because if you're dancing with someone and you can communicate it, and mm -hmm. that level of communication is happening, it's, yeah, there is this thing that just clicks in and you, and you understand that you have this really profound trust with someone. And you can have that kind of sense of profound trust with an environment or with a world. Say more about that. So like we're talking about the world, we're even potentially moving into the political space here. I know that's something you messaged me about before. So um, you know, the, the sort of so what here, I think is very interesting. Yeah, the so what? Yeah, why? so why does embodiment matter? Why does it matter that I am, um, um, I, I, that I live in a form that refuses to remain simply limited to my flesh? When skin, when my flesh is not the only Nita there is, when Nita in fact is a space of being because attention is tactile, I'm not a specific limited, just this little object of being, right? That mind and body, mind has, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, mind is not distinct from body in, this, in the sense that it, it, there, it acts in mind acts in the world. And if I walk into an environment with, and you were, you raised the word intention. If I walk into an environment angry and dark in my, in my and concentrated in my sensibility, I completely alter the space that I'm in. Not just because I'm gloomy, you know, because people can see me, they can feel me. Mm. <laughs> and, and that's not just happening with their eyes, is it? And, and so understanding our response ability, response ability being two words, being, uh, um, and I'm speaking from Karen Barad's um, inquiry, and she's, she's um, um, a uh, anthropologist, feminist, l looking at science and looking very specifically at such things as um, uh, quantum theory. But she speaks about our responsibility, this, in, this entangled state we are in with one another. And that entanglement is really critical to our work, um, yeah, uh, to our being in the world and my work. Um, I'm very interested in what is it that I do that can make this world a more lively, vital, and in uh, and engaged place, and how does my presence really change what is possible? That's responsibility. N me, not just with the human world, but me with the non-human world, the world. Um, and to do that, I have to understand I'm human and non-human. 
I am not, all parts of me are not human. If I look at myself on the level of, on the scale of water, and I am what percentage water? I mean, a vast percentage of me is water. Then that is water human? No, it's not. So, so really having an inquiry into what the human is, because that has, speaks profoundly to what it is possible for us to do in a world in which we are not separate and cleanly and clearly individuated. Individuation is highly overrated. Experiencing selfhood as a multiplicity is a profound action that comes from contact improvisation, from my work with contact improvisation. I can experience myself as many, which means that when I'm together with somebody else, that experience be, is simply enhanced. I, I easily move the boundaries of my being, easily and flexibly. Does that mean I have to stay there? Absolutely not. I need to be able to individuate. But I've done that. I did that years ago. It's not the only state I can live in. It is interesting isn't it, that practices of contact, whether they be you know, dance practices, martial arts practices, anything I think that's really in, interested in listening and connection, ultimately the, you realize the barriers of the self are slightly fuzzier than initially thought. And that can be... Yes. That, that can be pretty profound for people when they start realizing that. And it doesn't yes. have to be a, you know, a profound sexual experience or some sort of mystical experience. It can become quite an ordinary everyday thing to realize that this is the case. As you say, that your, your mind is influencing things, that, that those barriers are not quite as solid as may, um, may have been presented to us. Right. And in a, in a world in crises, it is really uh, seems to be significant and important for us to start to amplify our abilities to be present in a world that really needs us to act differently, to stop this stupidity of our individuation, because our individuation does make us stupid. As mm. physical beings, it makes us, it makes us dull. Yeah, this uh, illusion of world. disconnection. Illusion of disconnection. And, uh, yeah, sometimes people ask me about why embodiment, why the embodiment conference, whatever. And I say, well, you know, when we're connected to ourselves, when that it's the first presence, right? We can actually really connect to others, connect to what we care about, connect to the planet. These things are connected, right? Like this is one almost synonym for embodiment is connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have an institute that I developed um, a couple, a few years ago, 2016, called the Institute for the Study of Somatic Communication. We call it the mm -hmm. ISSC. And the Institute is a a network of dance ensembles, dancers who are researchers into that connection you're talking about. We work together as ensembles um, in different cultures. Uh, um, it's an expanding network, so we're slowly but surely entering into other um, cultures. So we are, we're in, Right now, we've got two ensembles in Germany, one in the UK, uh, one coming happening in Spain, one happening in um, Denmark. We've got another happening in um, one that might happen in Italy eventually. Um, they're they're just sprouting. They're um, and these are ensembles who are, right now we have because of COVID we have a virtual what we call collaboratory. The ensembles are collaboratories. And we have a virtual collaboratory just about to start to study the speed of attention. Because if you want to communicate, you have to be able to understand not only the speed of your own attention, but the speed of the attention of the person that you're engaged with, or the person, thing, whatever you're engaged with. And that ability to change the speed of your attention is a really important skill. So looking at the skills involved. Yeah, the speed of intent, say, say more what you mean by that, the speed of attention, speed what, of, what does it mean? The speed of attention? Yeah. So, you know, in, in, in so many movement forms, people say, 
that they want <clears throat> no mind. You know, stop the mind. Mm -hmm. but, but that's kind of not what we want. That's actually, the mind is not the issue. It's the speed of the, your attention that's the issue. And <clears throat> if you are in a boat on a stream, right, the water's coming down, and you drop something outside of the boat, your hat falls off, it's in the water. You, the stream is moving at the same speed that you're moving at. If you're moving at the speed of the water, you can just reach out and pick it up, right? Because there is no friction happening between you and that boat. You're, you're one action. <clears throat> if you stop the boat or if you move faster or slower than the water, that's not the case. If, if thinking of the mind is that stream, if you are moving at the speed of your attention, of that, that motion, if you're moving, your attention is moving at the same speed as your physical body is moving, now you can't feel any mind. You simply don't, there's no friction there. The mind and the moment, the, the, the world you're in, your actions in the world are happening at the same speed. And it feels like no mind, but in fact, you, what you want is this incredible, expansive ability to be present to not only the water, but everything else that's going on. And that's what it feels like when, you, when people reach for that no mind place. Not stopping the mind, but catching up with it, catching, moving at that speed. So it doesn't mean we move our bodies really, really fast. We have to learn to engage our attention to various speeds so that if I'm moving really, really slowly, I can be right in time with my action. I can move and be present in a, in a depth of presence, a depth of awareness and not be in what I would call chunky time. I would be thin slicing time. So having temporal skills is really important to being able to be in communion with the world. And communion is what I'm really interested in. How is it we can act in communion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does your passion come from? I've seen you light up a number of times in this interview and almost self-generate. And I don't think I asked you any particularly good questions. So you, you just kind of have a passion clearly for it. Like, I'm, I'm curious where your passion comes from. Wow. That I can't quite say. Be I think it comes from um, um, realizing that there is so much to know that we don't know. I feel like I'm right at the edge of, of this profound awakening that um, I'm working terribly hard to know more. What's here, what's here, what's here? If you live a life of inquiry, and I've been blessed in that thanks to contact improvisation to be living a life of inquiry, then I am, um, I am never without something to be fascinated about. I'm really curious about a life of contact. You know, you said it's been around 50 years. You were there at the start. You were you know, clearly a young woman when you started. And it's, it's an unusual life. You know, we mentioned um, Steve Paxton. You know, he's still dancing. I saw him dance in Portugal last year, actually. So I know he's still dancing. He's gorgeous. He's gorgeous. The, so great. You know, some of the senior people in the field, like Nancy Stark Smith, you mentioned, passed away. I was booked in for a dance retreat with her this winter, but um, sadly that won't be happening. And, you know, you have had a life of contact, a life of dancing and doing workshops and inquiring and all these things we've talked about. How's that been? Oh, golly, I'm blessed, aren't I? I mean, I, I, meet, I meet amazing, wonderful people. I, I, um, I am always interested to hear how is it that people are understanding their worlds. I understand, by the way, I also am um, an NLP pra master practitioner coach. So I have that kind of 
and that started in the early days of contact, by the way. That was an, um, uh, an ability to reframe things, which was very important to, to studying, to inquiry. Um, I think, I think, I'm, I think um, I have had the opportunity to n never not be interested, never settle, never get bored, never, never understand and seek repetition. I, mm -hmm. I really enjoy the flow. My teacher, my teacher is, does it work? in contact does it work with bodies uh, does it work in relations does it work and how does what's physical work in the emotional world how does the emotional work emotional world influence the mental world has our mental world influenced the emotional world the embodied world it keeps on, it's this extraordinary um for me um intertwining of of perspectives where where am i looking from this time there's always a new perspective and listeners, a new perspective will give me a new information listeners can't see this but it's actually very interesting i'd go to the youtube channel and watch this one because you'll do something in your body and then you'll have the word it's very interesting you're, you're like you're doing intertwining and your body was doing it and then you were kind of like oh what's my you know and then you started showing it and it formed and then you said the word as an interviewer it's fascinating because most people are the other way around they have thought and then they do something with their hands to try and express it you know whereas it's you it's like coming from the other direction it's, it's, it's quite fascinating to see throughout the interview it's uh, i guess a, a life of study what, what's your vision then for the future we're not done yet so um what's what's your vision well I, uh, the vision is to um give you know it's a giveaway dance i give away my vision is um can i set this this particular inquiry about attention about presence into motion with ensembles so that we become a more responsible world altogether um not 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 dominated by any one culture but that we are in communication with one another in order to accomplish this really important work as a world. Thank you for your body of work. Thank you for ongoing work. It's appreciated. Um, I look forward to listening to your session at the conference, the Embodiment Conference. And uh, yeah, I hope I get a chance to dance with you one day. I was booked into Freiburg to dance this year and that didn't happen because of uh, COVID. And other so, uh, <laughs> what do you know? It is what it is. Hey, practicing not attachment this year for sure. Um, where do people find you? Like if they want to look you up, they want to read your stuff, they want to look at video, they want to meet up with you in real life even, where do they go? Yeah, so as you probably have figured out, Mark, my, my website is under construction right now. And so is the ISSC website, by the way. So I'm working on two websites simultaneously. And um, I think the easiest way is to go to my Facebook page, Nita Little Dash Relational Intelligence. It's my, my Facebook page. I'm teaching relational intelligence online okay. um, on Wednesdays um, in the morning Pacific time. Um, you can find out about it there, Nita Little Dash Relational Intelligence. Um, I will put things like the embodiment conference there and when, when my session is happening. I'm very excited about that, Mark. What a marvelous project you have. It's really yeah, quite it's, I'm deep in it at the moment. I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's right now, it's crazy. But we just launched the, uh, the computer system, which means that we can sort of structure all the different speakers and have people find what they want and make some wow. sense of the, the, the big mess that it could be otherwise. So um, having the technology in place now is, is really special. And um, it's an amazing thing to offer people in this time when we maybe can't you know, dance or get together in person. Well, it's a great project and it's great to really um, bring embodied, you know, we, we talk about embodiment as if it were a single thing. It's not. There are many embodiments and diminished, most people live diminished embodiments 
And my job, let's, let's figure out what the potentials are of embodiment because I don't think we know them. Right, so. just beginning, the silos are just starting to talk to each other. You know, like I meet people and they, they'll say, oh, who's Steve Paxton? I'm like, really? Okay. You know, and I like, and they'll be embodiment people, you know? So it's, um, it's, if we can break right. some of this down, we're getting it translated into a whole bunch of languages as well. So oh, that we know okay. in Spanish, and German and Russian, all sorts of things. So some stuff that we can make global maybe for the first time. So uh, do you have a closing message about the body, Nita? Just uh, finishes off there, closing message. Well, yeah, um, I would say that the, the em embodiment, whatever it is, is, a, is an ongoing inquiry. There is no conclusion. There is no point at which you've arrived at embodiment. It is something that is because we are body minds, we are, uh, we are this constant expanding structure we are also neuroplastic which means we're an expanding structure in which our, our our neurons are constantly changing what we think we can be requires imagination because the neurons are going to grow with that our neuronal potentials you have to be able to envision it to do it so the world as it exists is not enough <laughs> The world is not enough. It's a James Bond film. Well, I love it. I love it. This I've I've loved your passion, uh, your wisdom. I'm gonna have to listen to this one back. So I think I didn't get everything the first a bit tired today. So I want to listen to it back and understand it a bit deeper. And uh, yeah, if I possibly can, I'll be at your session at the conference, Nita. So thank you so much. For oh, great, Mark. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>